Welcome to the Old Time Radio Westerns. I'm your host, Andrew Rines, and let's get into this episode. This episode is going to be Challenge of the Yukon. Original air date is March 3rd, 1951, and the title is Job for Jim Lackery. Let's get into it. The Challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest league dog of the Northwest. Blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On you, Husky! <laughs> gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Jim Lackey had come to the Yukon Territory during the gold rush and had brought his wife and ten-year-old son with him. They had staked a claim a few miles out of Selkirk on Beaver Ridge. And through the summer months, Jim had been able to dig enough gold from his claim to make ends meet. But when winter came, the claim seemed to give out. And Jim realized that he and his little family would soon be without food. One morning, Jim paced the cabin as he talked over the situation with his wife, Sally. We might as well pace it, Sally. The claim isn't paying off, and we're almost out of supplies. I know, Jim. It seems useless to try and work the claim anymore. The only thing I know of to do is to try to get a job in town. Well, if you could, it would help see us through the winter. And then in the spring, maybe we could sell the dog team and the cabin and the claim and go back to the States. Go back? Yes, I... Oh, Jim, I didn't know what it would be like up here in the winter, or I wouldn't have agreed to come here. The cold and all the awful snow and ice, it, it's almost more than I can stand. I wasn't thinking of going back, Sally. You'd feel different about it if we were making a go of things. I feel that our big chance for the future, for Bobby's future, is here in the Yukon. Oh, the only future I see for us right now is cold and well, perhaps starvation. Don't ask me to stay here, Jim. I've made up my mind that we're leaving as soon as we're able to get away. But if I find a job in town, maybe by spring we'll have... Jobs are scarce in Selkirk. You know that as well as I do. I guess it's the only thing left for you to do right now. But even if you do get a job, take it with the understanding that you'll give it up in the spring. And then we'll sell out... Be reasonable, Sally. If I do get a job, it'll be with the idea that maybe we can save enough to stake a new claim after the thaw comes. Why do you have to be so stubborn? I'm sure if you did stake another claim, we'd wind up facing another long winter in the same condition we're in now. Oh, please. Please, Jim, don't ask me to go through all this again. For my sake. For Bobby's sake. Now, don't get so upset, honey. (laughs) Things are tough enough as it is. Oh, but I can't... All right. I'll drop the matter for now. The important thing is to get money for supplies to see us through. But the matter isn't decided, Jim. When spring comes, we'll discuss it again. But promise me you won't make any definite decision about another claim without talking it over with me first. All right, Sally, I promise. Mom, I'm hungry. Is breakfast ready? Yes. Sit down, Bobby, and I'll fix you a bowl of mush. Oh, we had mush for supper last night. All we get is that old mush. Stop complaining, son. I'm going to town, and maybe when I come back, I'll bring some supplies. Gosh, Dad, that's what you said the other day. That you didn't bring anything back when you came home. Hush, Bobby. I... I'm going to town now, Sally. This time I'll be sure to bring home something. You can count on it, Bobby. The boy's complaint had upset Jim considerably. And he headed for town with his dog sled, determined to keep his promise to bring home supplies. His credit had been stopped at the general store, and he knew it was useless to ask for more. But he did enter the store with an idea in mind. Good morning, Jim. Doing any better with your claim? Nope. Uh, say, Mike, uh, how about letting me work for you for the winter? I could pay what I owe. Sorry, and... Jim. I've had a half a dozen ask the same thing. But I don't need anybody. Oh. Uh, why don't you try the cafe? They might put you on as an extra waiter or something. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'll try over there. I'm sure sorry, Jim. But you know if I could afford to take you on, I would. Forget it. I'll find something to do somewhere. Well, I wish you luck. But the town's full of drifters hoping to find jobs to see them through the winter. Yeah, I know. 
See you again, Mike. So long. So long. Leaving the store, Jim went to the cafe. He approached the cafe owner, who was standing near the bar. Good morning, Mr. Pryor. Hello, Lackey. How are things going? Not so well right now. I I came in to see if you might be willing to give me a job, any kind of a job. Lackey, you have the fifth one this morning who's come asking for work. I have more hands now than I really need. But you needn't pay me much. Just enough to buy supplies for me and my wife and son. <laughs> I have a couple right now working just for their meals. I'm sorry. But... Never mind, then. Thanks, just the same. As Jim turned away, with disappointment and desperation showing on his face, two men who had overheard his request whispered together at a nearby table. Then one of them called out, Hey, fella, come here a minute, will you? You call me? Yeah. Sit down a minute. We want to talk to you. Might as well. What's on your mind, mister? I'm Mark Harvey. This is my friend Van Layton. Hi. My name's Jim Lackey. Glad to know you. Yeah, from the way you looked when you were turned down, Lackey, you must need work bad. I sure do. Have a wife and boy to feed back on Beaver Ridge, where my no-good claim is. Well, maybe. And remember, I'm just saying maybe. We could throw something your way, Lackey. Well, you... You mean you could give me a job? Well, uh, what we have to say is confidential, so... Keep your voice down. Yeah, we have a deal on it. And if others get wise, they might beat us to it. That's right. But the job. If you can give me work, I'll do anything. Just so I get paid enough to buy supplies. We decide to use you, it'll pay plenty. That's right. But uh, you'd have to keep your mouth shut. Or you'd spoil our deal, eh, Mike? Yeah. I don't know. On second thought, Van, maybe we'd be taking a chance. No, honest. I don't care what it is. And I'll keep quiet about it. Just so I get the job. Well... Maybe we'll be able to use you at that. Come on. Let's go to our room at the hotel where we can talk in private. All right. I think we might as well let you have the job as long as you need one so bad. Let's go. Mark Harvey and Van Laken took Jim to their hotel to discuss the work they had offered him. After they were seated in the room, Jim asked... Well, what is it you have to offer? We noticed from the window of the cafe that you got a dog team. That'd have to be part of our agreement, Lackey. Yeah, that's right. Then what you really want is to hire my dog sled and have me drive it, is that it? Oh, we want the dog sled, all right, but we'll do the driving now, Van. <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't get this. You said you had a deal on and might be able to give me a job. Now you say you just want to hire the dog team. You could hire a team at the livery stable. Sure, but we don't intend to bring it back. Man. Wait a minute. You think for a second that you're going to get... Shut up and sit down. Hey, why the gun? I said sit down. Oh, all right. Tie him up, Van. Tie him tight. Hey, what's the idea? Uh, sure. Got the cords already. Now, look, you don't have to tie me. Anyway, I'm not going to let you steal my dog team. Oh, shut up! No. Let's put him out cold. Yeah. I'll try and gag him. I'll wait before you tie him. I'm going to change parkers with him. We'll leave him tied and gagged in the closet here. Yeah. The room's paid to the end of the week. They won't clean up till then. We'll lock the door. And nobody will find him for several days. Let's get busy. The two crooks, Mark and Van, tied and gagged Jim Lackey after Mark had taken Jim's pocket away. The unconscious man was put in the closet. There! He won't come to for a long time. When he does, he won't be able to attract attention. Come on out and close the door. All right. Well, we have a long wait before we do what we plan, Mark. We got to get his dog sled without attracting notice, too. That'll be easy. You stay here and wait till I get back. Yeah, where are you going? I'm going to the cafe and get Lackey's dog team. But somebody might see you taking it. Look, this park of Lackey's is all I need. Look here. Pull the hood forward like this. If anyone happens to spot me from the cafe window, they'll think it's Lackey leaving with his sled. Yeah, that's right. Your body size and all... Where are you going to keep the dog team and sled until we're ready to use it? I'll run it behind this shed that's in the back of the hotel. The dogs will burrow in the snowbank and nobody will notice them. Anyway, folks won't be looking for Jim Lackey since they won't know he's disappeared until we're a good distance away from here. Well, what do we do after you get back here? Sit around this hotel room for the rest of the afternoon? No reason to. We'll both go back to the cafe. And when we're ready, we'll do what we planned. I'll go get that dog team and sled. Oh, 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 oh. 
That evening, Sergeant Preston, who was following the trail to Selkirk, stopped the lackey cat. Hulking! Hey, uh, come on, boy. Oh, Sergeant Preston and King, do come in. Thanks, Sally. Come on. Golly, there's King. Hiya, fella. Where's Jim? Isn't he home? No, Sergeant, he isn't. And, well, frankly, I'm worried. Worried? It isn't late. Jim left this morning to try and find a job, and I expected him home before this. You say he went to find a job? Yes. Yes, the claim is given out entirely. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Dad said he'd bring back some supplies. We only had mush to eat yesterday and today. Hush, Bobby. Oh, things are that bad, eh? Yes. Yes, Sergeant, I... I've never seen Jim so discouraged. Frankly, I hope we can leave here in the spring for good. Jim doesn't want to. If he finds a good claim, things will look different, Sally. Now, don't you worry about Jim. I'll look him up as soon as I get to town. Thank you so much, Sergeant. Come on, King. We have to be going, boy. Bring King back again soon, will you, Sergeant? Yes, of course. Bye for now. Goodbye, Sergeant. Let's get going, fella. <laughs> up front, boy. <laughs> All right, one king, one your husky. Sergeant Preston arrived in Selkirk, and after stopping at the constable's office, he searched the town for Jim, but without success. Meantime, Van Laken and Mark Harvey, who was wearing Jim's parka, moved cautiously behind the general store. It had begun to snow, and Mark seemed pleased as he spoke in a low voice. <laughs> Everything's working out our way, Van. The snow will cover our tracks. Yeah, that's a break, all right. Well, it's about time for Mike to close. Yeah, he closes at midnight. He comes out the back door and then locks it after him before he goes to the cabin. And you'll see the dog team there at the corner of the building. Yeah. The light shining from the windows of that building next door is just enough so as he'll be able to see me and the dog team. Yeah, think he'll recognize Lackey's dogs? Sure, that white Siberian lead dog of Lackey stands out. With a bandana over my face and Lackey's parka on... You'll think I'm Jim Lackey. <laughs> he keeps plenty of cash in his safe. Mm-hmm. When he steps out of the door, I'll stick my gun in his back and make him go in and open the safe. Now, you keep out of sight until I signal you through the window. Oh. The store will this one out. He's going to leave. This is it. I'll wait here alongside the door. You beat it around the corner of the building. All right. Hold it, you. Glory be. Get inside. Now, go off. Sure, sure. The reflection from next door gives light enough. Open the safe. Hurry. You won't get away with get this. Get busy. All right. There. It's open. You better think twice before you go through with this. I got a glimpse of your dog team outside. And even in this dim light, I recognize that patch of black fur on your parker. Changing your voice like you have don't help any. I know you're Jim Lackey, so you better not try... (laughs) Hey, Van. Come on. He's out cold. Did he say anything? Sure. (laughs) He said he knew that I was Jim Lackey. Come on, let's get the cash from the safe, and we'll take some supplies and head out of town. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. It was some time later when the storekeeper, Mike, entered the constable's office with a handkerchief tied around his head. Sergeant Preston and the constable both looked up in surprise. Then the sergeant asked, What happened, Mike? Sure, and I was held up and robbed, that's what. Sit down, Mike, and tell us about it. Well, now as I remember, this is just the way it happened. Briefly, the storekeeper related what had taken place at the store store up to the moment that he'd been struck down. The two Mounties listened intently. Then Sergeant Preston spoke. Evidently, it was done by someone who knew your habits, Mike. Was it light enough for you to get a look at him? It was, Sergeant. And to sad I am to have to say I'm sure he was Jim Lackey. Jim Lackey? That's hard to believe. Well, maybe it is, Constable. But I got to look at the dog team he had waiting I recognize Jim's lead dog, for one thing. 
And for another, I recognized his parka. It had a big patch of black fur at the bottom where it had been mended. That could have been Jim, all right. Didn't you see his face? Nah, just his eyes were showing above the bandana he wore. He spoke in a low tone and seemed like he was trying to change his voice. But Jim Lackey, I can't understand why he... He came looking for a job early in the day. Said he needed supplies and didn't have any money. That's right. I stopped at his cabin on the way here this evening. His wife told me they were practically destitute. He cleaned out my safe and a lot of supplies were missing from the store. Did you tell him you recognized him, Mike? Sure. That's when he socked me and knocked me out. I'll get my dog team, Constable. I'll take King and try to pick up the trail to back of the store. Well, why not just go out to Jim's place, Sergeant? It seems to me that's where he'd head with the supplies. That's what I think. Mike, I want you to take supplies out to the lackey cabin first thing in the morning. I'll see that you get paid for them. Great day. First the young spalpeen robs me and knocks me on the head. Then you say for me Mike, to bring... Mike, Jim Lackey is not stupid. Knowing that you'd recognize his dog team and that parka... That's right. Let me finish. Knowing that, and his only chance of escaping the law would have been to kill you, instead of just knocking you out. Uh, it was Providence that kept him from putting a bullet in me, no doubt. No, I think it was definitely planned to knock you out. So that you could identify him later to the police as Jim Lackey. Sure, and that doesn't make sense, Sergeant. I don't believe he'd be foolish enough to leave his team with that distinctive lead dog in full view. Nor would he wear that parka with a black patch if he planned to rob someone. What are you driving at, Sergeant? Jim didn't hide the fact that he was in need. Yeah, that's right. I heard he was asking for a job all over town. Don't you see? He'd be perfect as a frame-up for someone who wanted to commit robbery and get a team for the getaway. Oh, then you think Jim Lackey might have been framed by someone. That's right, Constable. The only way to prove my point is to get on the trail of the thief. But if he doesn't turn out to be Lackey, what do you suppose Jim is? That's what I want to find out. I looked all over town for him, but since King isn't familiar with his scent and I had nothing belonging to Jim, we weren't able to find him. I got my dog team ready now, and then we'll go to the back door of the store. King will pick up a scent there. Come on, King. <laughs> Meantime, the two crooks had headed north. After traveling about two hours, Mark spoke. We'll soon reach the deserted shack I told you about, Ben. Then we'll put up for the night. This uh, fallen snow will keep us from being followed. Yeah. When they hear the news, the Mondays will head for Lackey's cabin and wait for him there. <laughs> the poor sucker will get a job all right. You wind up breaking rock in prison. I guess you forgot we left him tied and gagged in that hotel closet, huh? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, uh, maybe by the time they find him, he'll be dead. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? One thing we didn't think of, Mark. When they find him in our room, then the Mounties will start looking for us. Ah, forget it. We'll stay in hiding, and they won't be able to pick up our trail. Well, there's the shack just ahead. Must you, Husky? Must! When the two crooks had gone into the store to get supplies, they had stepped in grease drippings behind the counter. Sergeant Preston and the constable took King to the back door of the store, and it was this strong, greasy scent, augmenting the natural scent of the crooks, that King followed. He disregarded the lighter scent they had left coming from the hotel. Preston and the constable followed as Yukon King led the dog team along the trail left by Mark and Van. Trail King's following goes in the opposite direction where Lackey's cabin's located. I'm beginning to think you're right about it being someone else, Sergeant. Jim would have taken supplies to his family. I'm afraid he's been murdered. I never thought of that. We'll find out when we catch the man we're trailing. He has a good start on us. I'm hoping he'll stop to rest somewhere, Constable. He wouldn't expect to be followed in this falling snow. Evidently, he never heard about King. Without King, we'd have been stumped at that. Oh, I see a light up ahead. Must be a cabin there. Maybe we'll get some information if we stop there. We'll stop here and go ahead and investigate that cabin, Constable. Looking! Hi, Husky! I'll take King and circle around so we'll come up behind the cabin. All right, let's go. Come on, King. Inside the shack, Mark and Van, who had slept a few hours, were having coffee before hitting the trail again. Where's a good place to hide out, Mark? If you thought of one? Yeah, we'll hide out at a trapper's shack at Pelly's Landing. Mount Diesel expects us to hit for Whitehorse or Dawson City. (laughs) He'll be hunting for Jim Lackey for two, three days. That'll give us time to get there. That's right. And remember, with that fallen snow, we're not leaving the trail. Hey, listen to dogs out there. Maybe a bear or some other animal snooping around. Yeah? Maybe. We're going to make sure. Get up easy like Van. Go flop on your bunk. I'll blow out the lamp as if we're going to rest a while. Yeah. I don't get it. It's dark outside. Anybody snooping could see us through the window. Oh, yeah. But well, after you lie down and the light's up, get on and put on your park. I'll put on mine. And he's out the front door. Even though it's dark, 
It's not too dark for us to sneak around the shack on either side with our guns ready and see if anyone might be there. If you do see anyone, shoot. Get up and go to the bunk. All right. I still think it's only an animal. We know we couldn't be trailed with the snow falling to cover our tracks as fast as we made them. You're a fool. Even if someone didn't trail us, it might be a traveler who saw the lighted shack and came here to investigate. We can't take a chance of being seen by anyone. Oh. Now I get your point. I'll go lie in the bunk like you told me. All right. Well, might as well put out the light so as we'd be able to sleep a while. Now, hurry. Get into your parka. The dogs see us. Let's stop behind this shack. Right. Quiet, King. Look, the light's gone out in the shack. Yes. Dogs must have put him on guard. The two Mounties and Yukon King had stopped behind a small shed. Preston cautiously looked around a corner of the shed. He could see along one side of the shack from his position, but not the other. He waited a few moments. And then as the dogs quieted, he was about to move toward the shack when he saw a figure appear and creep forward alongside the building. I see someone. He's moving this way. Let's get him. Come on. Right. The two Mounties moved quickly from behind the shed, and as they ran forward, Preston called out, Halt in the name of the con! Mounties, I'll fix you. Don't try it. His gun dropped. We've got him. Good shooting, Sergeant. My arm. We'll fix your wound as soon as we get you inside. Come on. All right, get going. You first. Come on, hurry up. Not knowing that another gunman was on the other side of the shack, the two Mounties started toward the front door with their prisoner. Mark had heard the sergeant call out and had heard the shot. They got Van. Realizing that Van had been wounded, Mark retraced his steps to the corner of the shack and waited with ready gun for the two Mounties to come around to the front door with a wounded man. You've got nothing on me. The two Mounties started forward after seeing Van. And the great dog king started to follow. But the intelligent dog decided there was something wrong. He had followed two cents along the trail, but he saw only one man. King knew he must find the other one. So he turned and headed around the off side of the shack. There he saw the other crook, Mark, who had turned back and was moving toward the front after hearing Preston call out to his partner. King stalked cautiously behind the unsuspecting crook, who was watching closely for the Mounties to appear. As they came around the front corner of the shack opposite him, Mark aimed his gun, and then King sprang. The big dog sudden lunge had set Mark sprawling, and he lay struggling on the ground. What's the wounded man? No. Don King, gun fellow. I'll pick up this gun. I'll get up, you, and we'll all go inside. Well, we didn't know you were mounted. We heard someone snooping. You got nothing on us. We'll soon find out. Get inside. Bring the other one, Constable. All right, Sergeant. Come on, you. Come on, hurry up. Watch them, King. Hey, look, Sergeant. That parquet's warning. The one with a large black patch of fur, that's Jim Lackey's. Yes, and I noticed that dog team outside belongs to Jim, too. Bring over that carpet bag that's under that bunk there, Constable. Sure. I'll bet Mike's money and gold is in here. I'll open it. This is the golden cash stolen from Mike's safe, all right. Mike described it. Five pokes of dust and the rest in gold coin and paper money. Who are you? What are your names? I'm Van Laken. He's Mark Harvey. You had Jim Lackey's dog team and his parker. If you've killed Lackey... No, no, we didn't kill Lackey, honest. Where is he? Speak up. Okay. He's back in town, in a hotel room. He's he's tied and gagged in the closet. That's right, so you can't pin a murder rap on it. That depends. He may have suffocated in that closet with a gag in his mouth. That was Mark's idea. Shut up, Van. No, I won't. He he planned it like that. But after he left, I, I went back and opened the door part way. Oh, Sergeant, you were right about someone trying to put us off the trail by blaming Jim. Let's hurry, Constable. We'll bind that crook's wound and we'll head for town. And let's hope we find Jim Lackey alive. The following morning, the two Mounties arrived in Selkirk with their prisoners and went directly to the hotel room. Go on inside, both of you. Watch him, King. Well, look in the closet, Constable. I hope he's alive. There he is. Jim, help me untie him, Constable. All right. His gag's loosened. Now his wrist. Right. There. That does it. Seems to be gone, Sergeant. Help me get him to the bed. Sure. He's still alive. He's coming, too. Good. It's lucky for those two crooks he didn't die. Jim. Jim. Sergeant. Sergeant Preston. 
Uh, it's all right, Jim. We caught the crooks. We'll take you home just as soon as we get them behind bars. I'll stay here with Jim if you want me to, Sergeant. All right, Constable. Come on, you two. You're under arrest in the name of the Crown. Let's get going. <laughs> Jim Lackey, weakened by the blow on his head and by the ordeal he went through in the closet, was taken home and put under a doctor's care. Two days later, Sergeant Preston, with a constable and Mike the storekeeper, paid a visit to the Lackey cabin. They found Jim sitting at the supper table with his wife and boy. While Bobby played with King, the three men sat down to have coffee. Finally, Sergeant Preston smiled and spoke. Jim, you went through quite an ordeal in your search for a job. But you seem to have fully recovered from your experience. That's right, Sergeant, I have. Tomorrow I'm going to start looking again. The supplies you sent out, Sergeant, will see us through for quite a while. I wish I was big. I'd go find a job, too, I bet you. Oh, you have a few years to wait yet, Bobby. Oh, bless his heart. He wants so much to help us. You'll be going to school in Selkirk in the spring, Bobby. Best way to get a good job when you grow up is to learn all you can. Bobby will go to school, Sergeant, but I'm reasonably sure it won't be in Selkirk. If there's any possible way to get back to the States... But I like it right here, Mom. And so does Dad. Yes, Sally. Maybe if I do get a good there job... There are no good jobs to be had here, Jim. I'll not let you try to work another claim. But if, as Jim said, he did find a good job, Sally, what then? Well, perhaps if it was a lasting job that would give us mm, a good living, That's I... your cue, Mike. Tell them why you came out with it. Yes. Well, you see, Jim, I got to figuring. I'm getting along and can't do things like I used to. Now, I got to talking to the sergeant. Well, he showed me where it'd be smart for me to take on a young fella who could later on run the business for me. Jim, Mike wants you to work for him permanently. Sure, that's it. It is a fine business, and you might work into a partnership someday, Jim. I'd like to have you. What do you say? Gosh, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Jim, I think it's wonderful. <laughs> then you'll let Jim accept, Sally? Oh, yes, of course. Golly, then we'll be get then we'll be able to get all the all <laughs> we want to eat. And that'll give me candy, too, sometimes, won't he? Sure, that's right, Sonny. <laughs> Lots of supplies for the family and candy for you whenever your dad decides you've been a good boy. Gee, Willikin, <laughs> I'll be a storekeeper maybe when I grow up. Oh, Bobby, I thought you said once you wanted to be a Mountie like Sergeant Preston. Gosh. I don't know. <laughs> you have plenty of time to make a decision about that, Bobby. Anyway, you'd have to be a British citizen to become a Maori. Well, then I'll learn to be a storekeeper like Dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, that seems to be settled. Thanks to you, Sergeant, and to Mike, I'll get a job far better than I hoped for. Well, now that the two, two crooks are in jail and a job for Jim has been arranged, this case is closed. <laughs> In our next adventure, two men are lurking in the darkness outside Mounted Police Headquarters. Well, Tappan, Sergeant Preston has found Gonzalez. He and his wife are inside headquarters right now. Good. We'll wait here till they come out and then trail them. <laughs> that sure was a smart plan you figured out. We couldn't locate Gonzalez ourselves, so we tricked the Mounties into finding him for us. Yeah. And now that he's been found, we won't let him out of our sight till he leads us to those rubies. And we'll kill him and his wife and grab the rubies for ourselves. Lee and Elaine Gonzalez are in terrible danger. Sergeant Preston doesn't realize that fact. And by the time he finds out the truth, it may be too late to save them and himself from death at the hands of two ruthless killers. Be sure to hear this next exciting adventure tomorrow. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye and good luck until our next adventure. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
This has been a presentation of otrwesterns.com, and we hope you enjoyed. Please take some time to like and rate our shows in your favorite podcast application. Follow us on Facebook by going to otrwesterns.com slash Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel by going to otrwesterns.com slash YouTube. And send us an email, podcast at otrwesterns.com. You can call and leave us a voicemail, 707-986-8739. This episode is copyright under the attribution non-commercial share like copyright. For more information, go to otrwesterns.com slash copyright. Have a great day, and thanks for listening.